<laughs> Hello, everybody. I hope we're wherever you're at, if you're tuning in live with us or you're turning it later on our YouTube. My name is Danny Lay. I'm an adult service librarian here at the Santa Clara City Library, and we are going to have a wonderful time with uh, our special author and guest. I like to read her bio and uh, and also we'll just jumpstart into the conversation. Melania Luisa Marte is an American writer, poet, and musician from New York living between Dallas and the Dominican Republic. Marte's poetry explores her Caribbean roots, intersectionality, and self-love. Her most viral poem, Afro-Latina, was featured on Instagram on IGTV for National Poetry Month and has garnered over, probably by now, million, 9 million plus views at recent memory. Her work has been featured in Ain't, Ain't It I Latina, Me Too, The Root, Teen Vogue, Facebook, Telemundo, Sugar, uh, Pop Sugar, and Afro Punk, among other uh, publications. And her newest collection of poetry, Plantains and Our Becoming, is currently out now. Let's give a warm welcome for Melania. Hey, everyone. Um, first of all, the fact that having you here during the early part of your publication, uh, probably press junket and interview cycle, uh, is a pleasure, especially for public libraries to be able to uh, host and create a platform for uh, my favorite type of writers, which are poets. Um, and we're kind of grateful to be able to have you come share your work, speak truth to power, and uh, being able to maybe to chat with you and have some of our patrons be able to ask some questions as well. Um, what I'd like to do is at now offer uh, this virtual podium for you to share your work with us, uh, Then, and we'll get into the Q&A afterwards. So if you're all ready, I'll let you go on ahead. Okay. Um, should I, is there any particular poems you'd like me to read or just whatever I, feels good? Whatever feels good. I think uh, I trust that your words will ring true from yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. I'll start with um, Abuelita's Garden. For those who have a copy or have rented from the library, it's on page 20 if you want to follow along. Dios de me bendiga are her first words to her garden. Early mornings after the roosters are done preaching and the dogs have stretched downward and long, their spines half moon of fur and muscle, the birds chirp in search of crumbs and water. Pebbling through air and ground, they find Abuelita's basket of scraps left out for them to feed. In her garden, there is always something for someone to feed. No thing is left homeless. Dios de me bendiga. She glides through her garden, broom in hand, a thing hugging leaves and slim branches, an upended bouquet of shrub, greenery embracing a saged wooden pole, Everything about this woman could decompose and leave not a sight of ruin. I admire that. How much of this earth she honors and will one day become. There is a lesson in humility. Only those who have seen the bottom of an empty stomach can fathom. There is a lesson in survival. Only those who have seen the earth turn over and spill its fruits can witness. Mouth dry and aching. Many have found solace in my abuelita's garden. A water apple a warm cup of coffee, a sweet soursop, green bananas, a buttery avocado, an earthy cup of dragon tea, the world's best mangoes. Her garden is a multivitamin, breakfast or dinner, each disciple lucky for the harvesting season, my abuelita, the apothecary, the curandera, the cook, Dios se me bendiga. After the wilderness is done rejoicing, it's her time to speak of God in miracles, her plans dewy and grateful. Here is a mother who loves them as if they were birthed from her womb, and just as wise as the earth they rose from. Abuela affirms them before the sun affirms them more. Dios te me bendiga, mi negra bella, mi poeta, mi semilla, mi bendecida. Her blessings are a garden of endless love. They tell me live, 
Live because you sprung from me. Live because I dare you to live and thrive. Thrive because the birds, the flowers, the reptiles, we all want to witness your glory. Abuelita's garden is my favorite reminder that you don't need to be one specific kind of magical to bloom. We are all becoming our best, greenest things. We slouch and freeze. We stunt and cry. We look up and there's a star warming our skin. There is a hand blessing our flesh. From dust to depression we become. From twirls and teachings we rejoice. Dios se me bendiga. And we all bloom. So that's a poem. So I'm going to kick it off into part two now and read a poem from part two. Um, let's see. I'll read. Echa completa. There are resorts on the island where the women vacation in hospital beds, closets of fajas, sutures, IV fluids, disinfecting gauze, soup containers, and massage oil enter and all becomes one big fat blur. Like factories, Barbies enter waxy blobs of insecurities and exit echa completa, a flesh piñata of new skin, new body, new attitude. Suddenly, they hear beautiful and believe it. They hear bad babe and think me, it's possible to be as flawless as I want to be, to own my body and a part of this earth to demand equity and power. They can finally look in the mirror and see value, see a whole woman unbutchered by the scent of rumoring flies and flaws. What does it mean to be cut open in order to be made complete? When I say beautiful, what I mean is the thread of my body is unraveling itself into a war factory of roses. May they stain and scare all those who dare touch. My body here's perfect and morphs into a pink submachine gun. My waist here's invisible and snatches itself into a belt of spikes. My lips here lovable and grind the tears of ex-lovers into dust. What does it mean to weaponize your body in order to bear the weight of this existence? In cases of pre-war, an increase in war probability tends to decrease stock prices, but the ultimate outbreak of war increases them. There are empty factories of machinery waiting to be appreciated. Our bodies as is are waiting to be appreciated. How they hold all our insides and then some how they forgive the butcher and reprieve the soul. Some folks need war to feel peace and sometimes swallowing all that has tried to kill us is enough. What does it mean to need trauma to feel alive? It's brave, you know, to know the pain and choose it every single time. As long as the rent gets paid and the babies get fed and luxury is within reach, as long as someone sees his body and thinks it worth loving, worth fighting a war, worth the exchange of money. What does it mean to be a working body in a society that demands perfection? When I was 16, I wished for a nose job in lipo. I never told my mother who could barely afford to gift me life that I wanted to be just like her, hecha completa with a body that was either made by God or godly made, grant me access to pretty things from which to thrive. If we could eat beauty, how delicious it would be to devour all the lovely and finally feel complete. What does it mean to the human condition to fix what is never enough? When our bodies talk, how violent it be. And I'm going to share one more poem before we jump into our little discussions. Um, I'm going to look at part three now. This is called My Body Cries to Meg the Stallion. There's a sweet stream of sap coursing through my body. I know of insurrection like I know of this sticky song, the one the hot girls crack knees and necks for, the one that got Sarge Bartman smirking in her grave, the one that made us forget they made us mules before calling us human, the one the horse sings when it retires the last bag of rice, 
a sweet mercy to see it fall. Spent a decade earning its keep and finally get to shine. Fed the whole damn country town and now all she wants to do is dance. No noose tied to her crown. Each bag weighing 100 pounds. Half of me split twice. I know more baggage than I know of solid hooves. And this body always had a stage but never a spotlight. So here we are, hourglass front page, jiggle worshiped, time slapping beauty's deja vu into shade, the tale of Africa and Texas in her arch, skin a chestnut brown. What you know about that bone kind of black? What you know about Southern kinks? What you know about bodies that grow thick enough to sit their ass on your whole screen? What you know about a rap beat? tune of a freedom spell and a stallion goddess singing the body a love song what you know about waiting for summer just to feel the warmth of sun-kissed love a sweet stream of sap coursing through my body i know more of femicide than i know of this safety the one the hot girls crack knees and necks for her body asking for peace and penance never truly knowing what in the world is she being punished for? Okay. Woo. <laughs> Woo -hoo. How we feeling? We still here. <laughs> still here. We're all we're all listening intensively. Um, thank you for sharing those three powerful pieces. And um one of the what I love about um your book, what what you you shape in these narratives, the you painting these vignettes of uh, femininity, womanhood, power in that, also uh, the weight of the world pushing upon uh, those identities, and as uh, what you speak about yourself being uh, a Haitian and Dominican, you know, uh, Afro Latina, you know. Uh, yeah, to clarify, what, I'm. I'm Oh. To clarify, I'm, my ancestry comes from the Dominican Republic, yeah. um, but obviously I wanted to include Haiti because they share the same island and the history of Afro descendants are so interconnected, but I just wanted to clarify for folks who are like, oh, hey, always. I don't want people thinking I'm like passing as a Haitian yeah. person because that would yeah. be rude. <laughs> <laughs> no, correct uh, uh, away. That's that's definitely uh, right. Um what I love in terms of just speaking on the different diasporas out there and being able to help um, uplift these narratives. Um, for, first of all, what brought you into creating, um, you know, art for yourself? Um, I think it's very important to know maybe the artist's journey uh, and for yourself, was it, uh, were you a writer first before entering, uh, also allowing yourself to create music or are these art forms uh all of, one of the same in a way of how you express yourself yeah yeah so I actually as a kid I, I started writing poetry and then um when I was in high school I would play around and just kind of create these like freestyle and um you know when I was living on the island in the Dominican Republic I got really into like music and so as I was writing this collection I also had ideas to work on some music and then I released uh, my song Matatana and Madre Tierra and sort of like these fun songs that I just wanted out in the world I didn't really you know I, I want to work on an EP but I'm obviously <laughs> I'm a mom I'm a mom to a toddler and I have I have a lot of writing that I want published um, so I'm trying to, you know, just really go with what my spirit desires. And lately, the stories have been really pulling at me. And so I've been really just focusing on on my novel that I'm writing right now. And obviously, prior to that, this collection. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely don't, I don't ever want to be like, you know, pigeonholed into one type of artist. Because for me, I think that writing creates so many different layers of who I am as an artist and that can mean you know wanting to put a beat behind it and put the music behind it you know or you know wanting to expand beyond poetry and write and become a novelist and so like all of those things I don't I challenge myself to like not um not feel like I it's like too late to learn something new or to create something different so I definitely recommend for folks who are feeling stuck in one thing to try something different and, and see what you know and and really, uh, you know, become obsessed and like challenge yourself to become great at that thing that you love so much. 
I think your passion uh, and it shows and uh, if people get to read more into you, what you've done and continue to do is that you're very multifaceted. Uh, you've done narration uh, for audio books, yes. awards, you know, you know, doing that kind of thing. Um, not only just making music, but being in front of camera, uh, have some videos out there and very danceable, great music too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think Thank you. allowing yourself to uh, be true, right? Be true to who you are, but in that be as vibrant as you feel you want to feel, you know, and uh, as uh, expressive in that. Um, and that also I find in the poetry is that how you um, express and honor uh, the different places you've lived and, and those borders and uh, in those cities and these, and these people who've um, either help uplift you or contrast you through interactions. Some of the, one of the poems that really spoke to me in the collection was um, being stopped by uh, the police officer in one instant. And, and in that time, you know, feeling like um, just being stopped because, and also being in a way harassed because who uh, being a woman and like, do I have to act this way just to move on? You know, um, also, Another great poem was uh, how you honor the women in your lives, all the all the girls, you know, that you give a shout out to. I thought I felt the, that uh, sisterhood so strong, and because I know uh, uh, friends uh, who have that kind of click, and when they go rolling hard for each other, it's like you know they they got each other's back. So I really felt that and strength, and you know, from my uh, just me feeling more leaning towards being a feminist, how I support that. It's 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 uh it's very heartening to hear the energy that you're producing in this book. Um now with this collection, how long has uh, did it take to, you know, consolidate probably some of the you probably had more poems than this to choose from. Uh what how did it work out to creating the theme of your uh, collection and um what you wanted to tell in it? Because this is is this your second book, I believe, right? Well, this is my first uh, official, like published yeah. by a major publisher. Um, I had uh, I had self-published my own collection called Mela, um, which is about 60 pages, I believe, of poems. And um, then I was able to sign on with an agency, with my agent, Catherine Aaron at Folio, and they helped me um, create a proposal to sell this book. And so it was a beautiful journey because when I started with this collection, all I had, I had, I had like 10 poems, I think. And we kind of had this idea of where we wanted to take the collection, but I think it took a world on, on its own. And so I love that my publisher just, you know, my editors just gave me room to just breathe and figure out which poems, what kind of poems, how to just, you know, get it together. And then when I sent them my, um, my final, uh, my manuscript, uh, my first draft of the manuscript, and it was all these, and they just was just, they were so like they understood the vision and it wasn't in such a way that I had to like alter anything to make it more marketable or sellable. Mm -hmm. Like they were just very clear on how to market the, the collection and from our cover to just the fonts to the color scheme. I mean, everything just even this, like I was just like, this is just so beautiful. Like everything just came together so organically. And I'm so grateful for my team because they're just, I mean, they're just beautiful and amazing. And it honestly, <laughs> I tell people and some people are like, well, I've heard other stories from other writers, but I've had such a beautiful experience. And I'm just so grateful that I signed on with a publisher and with a team that really just understood from jump the, the story of the plantains and really wanted to honor my essence and not try to um, change the language or, you know, um, move too many things around and or strip the the collection of what makes it feel so refreshing which is that it is completely different in terms of form completely different and unique in terms of the language that's used I mean I use a lot of Spanglish I use a lot of Dominican Spanish which is very seldom seen in, in publishing and so all of those things and you know a switching from shorter poems to longer poems to a little bit of verse and all of that, that kind of just gave gave the collection something really refreshing that I 
I don't feel I've seen before in, in a poetry collection. And so it just makes it really exciting to just inspire folks to kind of take the take poetry, you know, and, and really tap into how they can tell their their family stories, their, you know, their community stories in refreshing ways and ways that challenge the status quo in ways that, you know, uh, center our realities on the page. So I'm super grateful that I get to be a part of that change. It's a, it's amazing change. And I think uh, for yourself, one, I give, I give your props to your team because Yes, it's probably one of my favorite collections because also the formatting, how you were able to uh, create a great range, but also great pacing of styles that reads refreshingly. You know, uh, I can go through some poetry collections and it just it can get a little heady sometimes. But this reads like uh, you're telling me some, you know, some amazing stories and it, it feels uh, like I, I I can sit with this or I can just keep thumbing through. And I think I blazed through this in a few hours, you know, a couple of times and uh, because awesome. it's like, <laughs> good, you know. Um, sorry, I think nobody knows I'm still in the library, but I was like, why are the lights turning off? Anyways, it's cool. <laughs> it's not haunted. Um, <laughs> we have a question from one of our uh, viewers, um, Jan Hennemeister. Uh, he says... Tell us a little more about your fam familial or cultural connections with the Dominican Republic. I think there's a huge Dominican population in New York, but not so much in the Bay Area. So I'd like to know more. And I'm sure we all do as well. Yeah, so um, I grew up, I was born in New York City. I was born in the Bronx. And then my, my family, my mom moved us when she got divorced from my dad. She moved us to the Lower East Side. Um, and I grew up most of my childhood in on the Lower East Side. And in between those years in my childhood growing up in New York City, we would go um, in the summers and sometimes during holiday breaks, we would go to the Dominican Republic and visit my abuela who lived, um, my my maternal grandmother who lived um, in Bonao in the, on the, on the countryside. And so I we on the island, we would spend uh, time there. And then we would also spend some time visiting our other side of the family who lived in Santiago and in Santo Domingo and so a lot of um, this is why the collection is kind of very uh, scattered in terms of geographical location is because a lot of the memories that were very um, fundamental to I think who I am were was a lot of that that back and forth you know that flying back and forth and so also then my mom also um, ended up buying a house in Texas and moved us to Texas when I was like 13, 14. And so then I, I, you know, my horizons in terms of identity in the United States kind of just shifted in a way that um, was unexpected because there are so few Dominicans living in Texas. And so in, in terms of culture, I was immersed then in Southern culture, in Black Southern culture, you know, in Black American culture in a way that um, kind of, shifted my my perception of race my perception on identity on culture and all of these things and so um yeah and then um for for college I went away to Miami Shores Florida um and that also gave me this kind of different perception of the way we navigate race and culture and identity and things like that so a lot of the collection is really exploring that because that really is my life like I I kind of had to really figure out how to navigate many different spaces and many different communities um and create my own language for it my own understanding for it and and I, I wanted to kind of extend that branch for other folks to explore what what their um, lived experiences mean to them and how they can navigate all of these issues and kind of conversations in a healthier way and a more grounded way where they understand um, that all of that makes them who they are. You know, for me, it was about creating a collection that allowed folks to understand that you don't really have to choose between worlds because they're all in you. Mm -hmm. And that that is what makes you so beautiful and unique is that you share very particular and in, 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 in unique ways of viewing the world through your eyes. And that is something that is really important when we have conversations with folks from different races, different identities in different countries is to really understand that we all view the world through a very specific lens and how can we expand on that conversation so that I understand what what 
you know, living in your skin live, means for you. And then you can understand what living in my skin means for me. And then we can kind of navigate a more equitable and, and equal and, you know, equally safe society for all of us. No, great, great answer, Jan. I hope you got that. It, it, that was, that was really good. Um, what I love about what you're, you express not just passionately, but eloquently is that the complexities of your life. And I think a lot of people maybe relate, relate to you, how they might have lived in different, um, uh, identities, different layers of who they are. Um, and for yourself being able to, um, write these stories. Uh, I don't know for you, if you felt like this was about being, uh, having courage or bravery to write them. Some people uh, are not so open to be able to manifest these, especially into a collection. You know, I think as myself, as also a poet, um, there are some stories or uh, pieces that only stay on the page and for myself. And while others uh, I will show, share openly depending on how the heart moves, but for yourself, you shared uh, so much that, yeah, I know now they're going to close lights on me. <laughs> so much about who you are and what you, you've dealt with. Do you feel that, um, was, it, was it easier to write uh, these narratives or sometimes, or were some of these poems hard to manifest? Did you need people to help you usher them out? Or you just uh, was it you just as easy as just putting it down and then speaking it onto the mic at an event? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that because I I do come from the slam poetry world where we're already kind of shedding skin on a stage, it sort of made it a lot easier for me I think than other folks. But I will say that I also use plant. And this is why it's technically fiction, right? Because I use the plantains. Uh, the plantains come alive in the, the collection. And so I use plantains sort of like a shield for me to kind of distance myself from a lot of the trauma in the collection. Um, and it helped me be braver <laughs> and have a lot more animosity and like, you know, just base and like power to my stories because I really understood that to write the story of the plantains, which is to write the story of, of, of my people, I had to really step you know like look at it from a bird's eye view I had to step outside of myself and so it allowed me to just write with much more uh fearlessly much more fearlessly than I would have if this were like a like a memoir you know mm -hmm. which I don't think I you know I'm not ready to write a memoir <laughs> like I'm still like unraveling and so I really want folks to just uh, you know understand that our stories are in, all interconnected and we have to be brave when we tell our stories, but we also have to protect ourselves and our hearts mm. and just like give ourselves grace to unravel those stories as they come along. We we definitely live in a uh, time uh, now of uh, hyper sharing, you know, and it can be much for people who either ride that wave and don't know how to get out. And for others who have yet to, you know, uh, a, bear themselves to a community of people they they know and don't know, you know, and letting that creativity run free uh, through likes or reshares or what have you. Um, but I think uh, what I enjoy about uh, the written word and how it's shared, it does uh, allow some of us to be free of something that's hold uh, things that are holding us back or the fear of uh, that, whether we're not accepted, uh, we feel insignificant. I think there's a power in freeing that, verbalizing that. Uh, and if you go to open mics or slams, spitting it, you know, into and, and letting people just take it as it is. Um, yeah. One of the most important things I what I love about uh, what you you write about, and 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 I I know that. Uh, for others who may not have the lived-in experiences as you do, but uh, it's it's important in terms of representation. And I think when people can write um, to educate or it's just share parts of communities uh, that they're unfamiliar with, it, it allows us not just saying peek into it, but it says it's an invitation that, that if we're not a part of this uh, community or these uh, individuals or these stories that we should know that they're out there that they, they don't they're not yeah. hidden they're always out there mm -hmm. um 
how how is that important uh for you um with you as a probably a person who is a leader uh or a person who people look up to uh to hear themselves in these uh, poems how important is it for yeah. you to continue writing like that yeah yeah i always want to honor um the folks in my life and so i really write to give them so much strength on the page and, and so much inspiration and so much vision for all, the beauty and the immense power that they have and love that they have. And I really always try to write stories that um, they can be heartbreaking, they can be grieving, they can be uh, just lost and, and turmoil, but eventually joy has to come in love has to come in there has to be some sort of redemption narrative because that's been my life I, I think that if if the folks in my life the women in my life the men in my life hadn't had this understanding that the sun will come up the next day you know the sun will always rise the next day I think I wouldn't be here I think that we wouldn't have survived so many things and so I always try to honor that vision and that gratitude for all that we have survived and just for the gift of being here in the present and having the opportunity to create um, and to just shed light on all the beauty that, that we are and in the immense, uh, the immense characters, because my family is so funny. My, fa my family is humorous. It's, it's full of strength. Um, they're smart. They're witty. They're quick on their feet. And so I really wanted to, to continue to write stories that honor all of the talent in the room because there's so much talent and it's just so like there's just so much swag so much sauce so much just spice you know I come from feisty <laughs> women you know I come from Matatanas and so I really want to honor that in all the stories I tell that's really um, my goal in life is to just if I can continue writing stories that make those women feel like yes you captured me you saw my humanity. I'm not one dimensionalized. I'm not flattened for, you know, readers who don't look like me. I'm allowing them the breath and the space to take up, you know, and breathe and exhale and scream and shout and, and be, you know, just their full selves, mm -hmm. you know, whether someone thinks it's right or wrong. You know, their full selves in in all of the ways in which they find uh just unique ways to survive and creative ways to survive and that's really my goal is to just write those kinds of stories that just make people see um the humanity within the flaws right in the humanity within the grand scheme of things but truly in the, the small um just feisty little acts <laughs> of just surviving turmoil and enjoy and love and all of the things that make a human live a full human life you know I just mm -hmm. want folks to, to see that we are just so much more than our trauma and we're also so much more than what folks make us out to be and so much more than our mistakes because a lot of this collection is really evaluating what makes someone you know who deserves redemption who mm -hmm. deserves to be free who deserves you know reparation and it's just like I know all these women have made decisions that they've had to make I know family members have had to make tough decisions and it really just comes down to them wanting to to experience their full humanity and that means sometimes making decisions that are shunned upon and are um considered just unconventional and strange and you know all of the things that just make you say oh okay wh what would I have done if I were in that position and so when I want I want folks to read my stories and consider what would I have done in that position you know if I had grown up in this kind of way and experienced these kinds of things and been racialized in this kind of way and had my identity consumed in this kind of way what would have been the choices I would have had to make and so it's really about just seeing each other's humanity and having empathy for each other. Wow. Um, I think you 
definitely shown through uh, your intentions with every piece in this collection, as well as the work and body of work you've done over the years. Um, I'm looking forward to, because it seems like you're going on the natural path. It'll be novel, then maybe memoir. We'll see. I don't know. You, you'll probably be doing maybe. <laughs> <laughs> way later, way later, way uh -huh. later. <laughs> um, let's see oh we have another question uh in the chat if, once again if you have questions please put it in the chat um in performance do you combine music and poetry are those two diff or are those two different but related performance experiences so it all depends so i have for example poems like for example in the book black spanish um, the first time I wrote Black Spanish, I put a beat behind it. I looked for like something that just felt like it had drums in the background. And so I just started like, just, just off the dome, just like, okay, what comes up to my mind? And, and the first line was, So it's kind of like, you know, like I'm freestyling. No pide perdón, no se excusa ni so me. I'm a Spanish walks into a room and you know it. These are S's at home. So like there are poems that just inspired me to find a beat to match. Um, and then there are poems that I'm just writing. I'm just focusing on the writing aspect. I'm focusing on form. I'm focusing on how the poem looks on the page. Does it look beautiful? You know, like the poem La Maleta. My friend, um, my friend Lorraine, and she's an amazing writer, Lorraine Avila, shouts out to her. She's also Michael Madre. Um, and she inspired me to turn that poem into a literal luggage because the poem is called La Maleta, which is luggage. And so she, we, I turned it into like this whole luggage. And it, you can see it on the page. And so, I, I, you know, it all depends on what the poem is asking of me. Um, but sometimes, yeah, the poems inspire me. And I'm just like, okay. And then sometimes I write a poem that is like a line that I think is going to be a poem. And it turns into a song. And that's how I wrote Matatana. And it really started where I was writing this line where it was like, um, me fui para el río, me despojé un alipo espiritual. And I was like, that kind of rhymes. Maybe I should turn it into a song. And then I, I wrote... I wrote the chorus and it's like, Matatanana. And then it was like, okay, what can I add to it? And then I started like, Piña Coco Solisal, me amo yo, lo quiero a to, pero luto no mi flow. And then I kind of like found a beat to match it. I was like, okay, let's go. And then I started writing the <laughs> verses and then did our own thing. And then I was like, I want to record this. And I went to the studio in Santiago and I recorded it when I was in the Dominican Republic. And um, and then we shot the video and it was just like so much fun. And so it all really just depends on what the inspiration is and what the direction is, because it can just turn into a million different things. Sometimes, I mean, I have this novel that I'm working on that I'm finishing up right now. And it started with a poem and the poem became the chapters in the novel. So it's just like, you just never really know where your brain and your spirit is going to take something, but it's just really beautiful playing with different forms and, uh, you know, different types of mediums because it's just really fun that way. And I really always want to keep that, that kind of that, I feel like a kid, you know, I feel yeah. like a kid who gets to wake up and just create something and it doesn't have to be this one specific thing. It can just be so many things. And sometimes it doesn't even have to go out into the world. Sometimes it can just be for me. I have tons of really bad poems that I'm just like, I don't want to edit it and turn it into a, like a really good poem for the audience. I just want to keep it for myself. So that's also a thing too. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's very important. Thank you for answering Jan's question that it goes back to the soul, uh, how you feel. I mean, you're going to, whatever gets released in the world has to be by your cho choice, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I love that you to uh, express that through poems or through writing. It can manifest into a physical form through an idea, you know? Or it turns into a song because you heard the cadence and the beat in, in your heart. And you're like, All right, I can I can flip <laughs> this into a track. And that's that's amazing because it just, you're telling us creativity can come from anywhere. Uh, if we're yeah. listening we're practicing that listening and uh, absorbing it uh, and also uh, making sure that we understand that um, we can do it as ourselves. Uh, but I know you're well-versed as I, I can tell with many things that you're doing. So it's, <laughs> it's no question that you know what you're, uh, what, what can be produced if you want to share it into the world. Um, I like to maybe uh, before we end, maybe one more poem, if you'd like to yeah. share. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm actually going to share I'm rooting for you. Actually, I'll share another one because that one's already on YouTube and I want to try to get something different. Uh, let's 
see. Okay, I'm going to share this one because it's funny and I want to end on a humorous note. This is called What Island Vibes Are Made Of. All I know is if the club don't got four horses, 10 scooters, five motoconchos, and siete motores parked outside, I don't want it. If the DJ don't play at least three different genres, one for the waist, one for the feet, and one for the soul, I don't want it. If the DJ don't ask where the single lady's at, and even the girls that came with their mans suddenly got attitude problems, I don't want it. If everybody not nostalgically slow bopping to the love Kelly and Nelly shared while they were cheating on their booze, I don't want it. If the fruity drink don't got real coconut milk mixed and mingled with the ripest pineapple bits lips can fathom, I don't want it. All I know is if the club don't got people sweating out their clothes, if love and sex don't infiltrate the dance floor, and if no one is tempted to leave barefoot and pregnant, then don't invite me, babe. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, um, for a person like myself who's been to many parties that were <laughs> cracking and not cracking, yeah, I, uh, I'm in the same boat. Yeah, we, we and you feel that energy, that pulsation, uh, the body language. Uh, maybe sometimes the heat when the AC is not on, but that's uh, exactly. okay. That's okay. It makes a great R and B song go go off. Um, yeah. that's, that's, thank you for uh, ending our conversation with that poem. But um, thank, you. thank you for sharing your soul, your uh, your personhood with us. And we're so lucky because there is a poem that you did dedicate to the New York New York Public Library. So there was yes. a shout out to libraries in this collection. Yes, that I. I Yes, I would not be here if it were not for my public, my local public library in New York City, the Hamilton Fish Public Library. Um, <laughs> I would go there all the time. I'm going to see if I can visit while I'm in New York soon um, and just shout them out. They're just amazing. I mean, they gave me so much, just so much creativity, so much excitement for poetry. I mean, they would do readings with us. Um, they would have activities, the computers. I mean, I would check out a book every week. It was just, it was just so powerful and so beautiful. And I'm so grateful. And I hope that, you know, we can continue to support the local library so that, you know, kids, the future, you know, the, the kids have access to these libraries because they need it. I mean, for me, it was super monumental having a public library close to my, my apartment where we live. And it completely changed and altered my trajectory. I mean, if I hadn't had access to all of these amazing books and to all of these amazing librarians who just inspired me to keep reading and, and to be a great student and to write and to do all of these amazing things, I wouldn't have had the the fierceness to follow my dreams and to become a writer and then this baby wouldn't be out in the world you know so it's just like come on support your local libraries because we need them that's right support your local libraries but also support the authors the writers who make these books uh it, it really helps one pay homage to folks like y'all so that y'all can make more books uh yeah. and that we can have more um more future writers, more future dreamers, doers, leaders, um, you know, the possibility of a community it connected and speaking without animosity uh, to one another from indifference and not understanding. You know, we're here to listen to stories and how we tell them to each other. Uh, Melania, man, I, I really hope I get to meet you in person and maybe a reading <laughs> sometime you come to the West Coast and to the Bay I'll Air. try, yes. We'll yeah. definitely try to make it happen. But other than that, you have fans here in Santa Clara, and we definitely Thank hope you. to uh, you know, follow you throughout this whole trajectory. So please, everybody, if you haven't picked it up or placed a hold yet, Plantains and Our Becoming is out now. Um, we'll catch you on the next one. And everybody, I have a, uh, uh, a survey form at the end of this. So please, if you enjoyed programs like this and you want to see more, answer the survey so I can program them. <laughs> all right, Melania. Thank I'll you, catch Danny. You on the next Have one. a good night. It's you. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Bye bye. Peace.